How's it going, everybody? I'm back with another painting demo, and this time it's Mistborn. Uh, it's based off of a book series by Brandon Sanderson. Uh, I had someone come to me asking for a commission of Vin, who's the main character from Mistborn, and was more than happy to help out because it's one of my favorite book series of all time, probably. Um, pretty much anything Brandon Sanderson writes is gold. So if you're into fantasy, definitely check him out. Uh, so with this painting, you know, the initial sketch, I, I drew this thing like 10 different times. So um, I just kind of cut to where I actually had a decent sketch going. And um, the thing with this painting was the client had requested that, you know, there'd be like a big foggy city in the background. And then within the story, there's like a giant temple and like this sort of evil ruler dude and uh, they wanted a, a shot of that in there as well. So, you know, I'm trying to figure out like a good composition that can showcase all of those things. And I'm also trying to think about my values right now. So I want my main character to be probably the darkest thing in the scene and have her silhouette read really well. Um, she has this really cool cloak that is like strips of cloth. So while awesome, that also poses a problem for composition, right? And silhouette, because it's such a noisy um, piece of clothing that it can be kind of difficult to uh, really lock in a silhouette with that thing flapping around. So I had to be pretty careful about it. Um, I settled on this city shot here as the background, and she's gonna be kind of clinging to the side of a building. So, I have her on a separate layer, and then I'm just using a perspective grid right now, a three point grid, and it's obviously kind of turned sideways. And then my third vanishing point, so I have like one kind of back where that bright spot and the tower are to kind of draw your eye back there. And then that's where her head is as well. So that's the main focal point. Then I've got one off to the side. And I've also got one down below. And when you're up high, you want your vanishing point to be below your canvas. Um, so I have kind of a basic idea of what I'm doing. And I'm like, I'm, right, I'm going straight to color. So I threw in, I found like a foggy forest image with the kind of lighting I wanted. And just threw that in as a base to get started on my color. I'm just kind of slapping it all over there just because I want to kind of figure out you know, I want to get a little depth in there and you don't end up seeing any of that when it's finished. It just gives me a good, good base and mood to kind of start with. Sometimes it really helps to do that. I think it can be really overwhelming when you're trying to figure out colors and mood and all these different things together. So if you just start with an, a photo, it could be of anything. It doesn't have to be the right thing. It just has to be the right colors that you want. Just throw that on in there so that way you're not working on a white canvas or blank page because even just for the confidence boost, I think it can help. So I've got, um, you know, I wanted her flicking this coin up into the air, right? The way coins work in the, the books, they're kind of important. They relate to characters and how they um, use metal so it's kind of hard to explain if you haven't read them I'm, I'm guessing a lot of you have because they're super popular but if you haven't like basically the characters can ingest metal and basically burn it inside of them and you know they are imbued with different powers based on that so you know one of them is like pushing well they only inter only interacts with metal so you throw a coin down on the ground and then you can push off of it and basically fly. It's kind of how it works. So they have, she's always constantly throughout the books, like, you know, throwing coins or finding different metal objects to push and pull off of in the world. To, um, so she can like traverse, like basically like Spider-Man. So if you look at my brushes, something I kind of wanted to talk about because People are always really concerned about brushes. 
most of this so far has been done with just like a you know soft sort of chalk brush and a round brush there's really nothing nothing important happening there what i did just now was i took a new layer and i drew out kind of the height that i wanted that first floor of the building with a door and a window and then i just transformed it into perspective on that building there and that helped me to kind of establish a scale. That's one thing that's kind of weird with environments is you have to make sure that you're considerate of human scale because everything is built for humans by humans, right? Unless, you know, there's extenuating circumstances uh, in your world if there's fantasy creatures. But for the most part, you want to have some semblance of scale and like, there's this mental thing that happens when you see a doorway, you instantly know how big a building is, right? I've talked about this a little bit before, but um, doorways, stairs, windows, um, vehicles, even like lamp posts, things like that can help too. But all of these things help your brain instantly just latch on to like, oh, I know how big that building is. Like, okay, that's like a four story building and then there's like a little attic right there okay um and then it you know helps you realize oh this is how wide the street is and uh things like that and then another thing that's super helpful also is um repeating that pattern throughout the depth of your picture so you know so i'm working on this mid-ground building now but are there a, at the end there's a building that's really close to our main character and that has a window that's more defined and the ones in the back and that window your brain's gonna kind of see the close window with the detail and almost like translate that information to the stuff that's further back so the stuff that's further back doesn't have to have the same level of detail at all and it shouldn't because then it becomes distracting and this is a really weird thing when you're painting you think like i need to detail everything and make everything look perfect you don't and it's better if you don't because it makes your brain work for it. There's it, your brain is exceptionally good at filling in gaps and um, creating shortcuts. I don't know if you are into psychology at all. I know I am, um, but I know I had a an art director at one point who um, talked about the idea of there. there I think there was a psychologist whose name was Gestalt, but there's a small branch of psychology called Gestalt psychology, and you can. If you look that up, what it basically talks about is all these different ways that your brain um, kind of connects patterns. So like if you had, you know, four dots that were in the shape of a square, like your brain would realize that's a square and almost like fill in the fill in this, the, the gaps in between and like close the square. Um, it's really interesting stuff. And I think that deeply applies to art. So if you look at my painting now, the background behind this, that first building I detailed, there's like nothing there, right? There's literally just a few marks. And then I put in some bright dots and like the dots that are closer are windows, but those other dots are just literal round brush dots, there's nothing. But my brain's like, oh, I see this one building. All these other things are buildings because I see this red light. So. The red light that's close is a window or the orange, and then the um, the ones behind it are obviously more lights, which denotes a very large city, right? I didn't have to draw the whole city. I shouldn't be trying to draw the whole city because it's going to just take away from what I want anyway. Now, with this painting, I probably should have been more aware. So I've got my character there, and I keep popping her on and off, but I'm like drawing behind it, and I don't need to be. I just got... You know, I was having a lot of fun with my environment. So I was like, yeah, you shouldn't be drawing all this stuff in the background. But then I'm like, yeah, it's kind of fun. Even though you're probably not going to see most of it, I want it there. Probably not the best use, to my use of my time, but <laughs> whatever. So the other really important part about this environment is mist. Uh, there's this mist that comes out at night, plays a, an important narrative role in the story and stuff. I don't want to get into it and spoil anything, but um, 
the mist is prevalent and important and it's always out at night so things get really misty and foggy and um i want to make sure that that's a big part of the image as well so i'm starting to get closer here to the um the foreground building i'm going to detail this guy up a little bit and you know i'm putting in some stuff like simple wood grain and then a little bit of light inside the window and i think you know you put a little bit of that information in and then it just improves the background even more because of all those little psychological tricks and i think you know some of my favorite artists really they're exceptional at implying detail uh you know, one one example that everybody knows is James Gurney, where when you watch him paint, you're like, he's not it doesn't look like there's anything like detailed almost, but then when it's done for somehow it's magically it looks like this perfectly detailed, amazing piece of art. And I think the way he does it is 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 on this track. He's obviously way better at everything because he's James Gurney, but I think the concept is the same. <laughs> so I've got my background in a pretty good spot, and now I've decided to move on to my main figure. So I want her in a like a somewhat tight outfit. I'm thinking like, you know, it's gotta it's gotta be gotta match the lore a little bit, but at the same time, I want her to look cool and sleek. Uh, one thing is she doesn't wear shoes and she's out. So she's got bare feet with kind of like wraps. Um, and then, you know, I'm just going to give her, I basically painted it like, like Batman or something right there at the beginning, but that's just because there's no color yet. So I'm going to, you know, change the color on the pants and then go through and add some more folds and stuff on the shirt area. And I just wanted it to feel like, you know, pretty form fitting like she was in my head almost like like a ballerina ish um i was kind of inspired by uh gwen stacy the spider-man character a little bit with her while i was working on this and i was just thinking because she has like ballet shoes and she has this whole thing you know but um yeah i just wanted her to look like athletic and um What's the word I'm thinking of? Almost like acrobatic, I guess. Because she like, you know, vaults off of stuff and she's flying around and jumping and doing all sorts of crazy things. So I feel like if her outfit was too loose and flowy, then that would, you know, make life difficult for her. But I always like seams in pants. I don't know. Part of it, I think, is that it helps describe the form and stuff. So I put those like I put a seam down like the middle and then also on the side. It's almost like it was cut from uh, different panels or something instead of just two, you know, maybe like. Yeah, like four panel pants. And there's like a panel in the front, too. Like I was just trying to go for like a different cut that didn't feel as modern, something that felt a little bit more um, archaic and not necessarily medieval, but because I don't know like the time period of these books. It's not quite medieval because they have like like some sort of like gaslight and stuff like that, but it's pretty old still. It's not like a steampunk era. It's still before that. So, so yeah, at this point, I mean, I've got it all grayscale. Right. It's kind of, well, it's, I guess it's blue, right? But it's pretty monochromatic. Um, and I'm just kind of going through. If I need to change the color, I add an overlay layer and then kind of adjust. Or, you know, usually I'll do that first sometimes, but then I'll just paint on top of it after that. So I'm worried about her face at this point. I'm going to paint over it and it's going to look like complete 
hot garbage for a while. But I also like to make, you know, giant stitches in clothing. I don't know why. I think it looks cool. So I put some on her pants. Like maybe they popped a seam and she just put these big fat stitches in there. So with the belt there, I just changed the color. So it was an overlay layer. And then I just flatten it down once I get the color I want. But she needs some kind of belt. And then I have a, like a coin purse or something as well. And then I'm also going to give her a dagger. But I figure she needed some sort of pouch to hold coins. And I also have the rest of the cape on a separate layer because I want to get like a solid silhouette with her figure first. And then I might do some adjustments with like the, the value of the cape in the background to make sure that she, she still pops out. Because like I said, I was worried about the shape of that cape really being distracting. I always think belts and pouches are super fun to draw too. Um, you can come up with all sorts of weird designs. Like it doesn't just have to be a normal belt, you know? When I'm drawing right now, okay, so I just darkened her shirt. I did that with like a multiply layer that time because I felt like the values were getting out of control. Um, the highlights were too bright for a cloth. I mean, cloth, the less reflective something is, the closer the values will be together. So something like cloth, it's very low reflectivity, pretty matte surface. So that means that, um, you know, it should be fairly close to the same level. All right, so right now I'm going into her face, right? And this is where things get ugly. And part of it is at the time I was sitting there watching TV, I'm drawing her face and not giving it as much attention as I should. So I think I go through it a couple times and it's just complete trash, right? So I'm going to bring in a 3D head in a minute. I draw over it and I'm like, what? Why does this look so terrible? I'm like, it's not the right like look at all that I'm going for. So. I'm going to bring in a 3D head on top of this and then just paint over the 3D head. Um, I think sometimes it's really helpful, especially for me. Um, I don't have any problem painting men usually, but women are way more difficult because the shape can like drastically change the age. Right. So like if it's too thin, she looks really old. But if it's too soft, she'll look too young. There's too many, like one extra wrinkle and it'll age a person like 20 years. With men, that's never an issue. Um, you know, they're always, you can always make them more square and more beat up. And they always look great. Doesn't even matter. So, um, yeah, women's heads are a lot more delicate and difficult for me. So there's my 3D head. Just threw it in and colorized it real quick and then um, just cut it out around the hair. And then I did that like skin tone adjustment there with some um, overlay. I had some pink kind of in the nose, the lips and the cheeks, and then a little bit of blue around the eyes and then maybe in a little bit of yellow um, in the forehead. Really subtle. And then kind of flatten that down. And then it's just a matter of me painting over that. And right now, I think, you know, at the point now, I'm like, yeah, maybe I shouldn't have done that because I don't think it looks as good as the first head. But once I'm all done, it will. And like the character in the book, she's pretty young. I think she's like 19 or 20, maybe. So uh, the face needs to be like nice, nice and like youthful instead of, you know, like mid 30s or something, <laughs> which was my old head. So I'm thinking about like a, you know, I've always got this bounce light kind of from the left. And I think that's kind of my, it's kind of a rim light, kind of a moonlight. 
sort of this bluish ambient kind of thing happening. And I'm not being as strict as I probably should with my rim lighting because I have another one coming up from the ground that's also kind of blue. And that one probably should be more of a red or an orange, probably an orange to catch all that street light. But I think there's times where you should make your lighting as correct as possible. And then other times where you can take a bit of a creative liberty with some of this stuff. So. All right, so our head is starting to look a little bit better. Once I get the hair sorted, I think she'll look a lot nicer. Um, I'm also kind of painting over her eyes as well, because the, the ones in the model were a little weird. So, you know, and that's a that's one of the keys with 3D models too, is don't be afraid if you're gonna use 3D. You don't have to assume that everything that that 3D provides you is correct or perfect. And then it's nice just to get it in there for like the shape and proportions and then you can always, um, you know, make your own decisions and change it. Don't feel trapped by it because that's, that's one reason I think like if you're starting out using 3D can really be a dangerous crutch. Um, if you don't know how to draw that well or your like anatomy skills aren't up to par, sometimes you're going to rely on 3D stuff too heavily and it's not going to serve you. You know, like you're going to end up serving the 3D. So you have to be careful and it can also make stuff look super stiff. Um, I worked at a studio where they required everyone use a 3D base. And a lot of the times, like, because we, well, we just didn't have time to draw it all. But a lot of the times, my stuff would just come out looking like, you know, these mannequins that were just so lifeless. And I think that was a lot of it. I mean, there was a, the lead artist there was super experienced and amazing. And his stuff always just looks fantastic. So you're like looking at his and you're like, his looks amazing. Why does mine look like, you know, this weird uncanny valley stiff thing. And that at the time it was because I think I wasn't, I didn't have a good enough grasp on my drawing abilities to really pull it off. So. All right, we're getting into the hair now. I need like a nice short hair because she kind of cuts it like a like a bob almost not a bob bobs are gross right i don't know <laughs> pretty short hair it's kind of dark it's going to keep that bluish color and i think she looks good now happy with the choice on the head at this point and that gave me a lot of relief um, you can tell I was avoiding it. And I can't decide if sometimes avoiding the harder things is good or bad. I think sometimes it's good. It's like every painting I do, it's like this psychological game, you know, where I'm like, oh man, this head, I don't know if I can paint this right. Or like these hands, like they look good right now, but I know when I go to render them, they're going to look like trash. So you have to kind of like, I like to sort of space out my battles, you know, like I know, like I like the way the hand look now, but I know like, okay, when I get in there to render it, like if I overdo it, it's going to look, it's going to break and it's not going to look good. Or, you know, maybe, maybe it'll look okay, but maybe I'll ruin it. I don't know. And that's stressing me out while I'm working on this other stuff. And then same with her foot. And then you're thinking about like, oh, this face is, you know, a disaster. So I like to space out the hard stuff work on something easy build some confidence then move into that tricky thing so that way you you have like the extra fuel in your tank to keep going when it starts to look worse and then you can you know bring it back up like with the face right it looked really bad and then i fixed it and now it looks good and so that 
improved my confidence while I was working, which then, you know, I worked on a couple little things and I'm like, all right, now I'm going to go tackle another tricky part like the foot. And then you're like battling with the foot for a while and you're going you're gonna to fix it and then you're going to move on. So that's how I do it to kind of keep myself feeling positive and keep myself from um, quitting or getting too discouraged. And it sounds silly, right? Because you're like, oh, you should just know that you can do it. But there's, I think, yeah, it's like this. It's like this battle when you're painting, right? And it's a lot, most of it, I think, is psychological. I think a lot of times with art, I know a lot of people who just quit. And I think you need to finish everything. Like finish what you're working on. Quitting should not be an option when you're working on a painting. You need to see it through because you could hit a point where you're just like, oh man, like this hand looks like garbage. I, I'm just, no, I can't do this. Should have done a different pose, something like that, right? And you quit. Or you redraw it 10 times and you're like, you still can't get it and then you just give up. But if you force yourself to finish your paintings, force yourself to finish everything. And then you'll start to see growth. Because you're pushing through those hard times, which will inevitably make you a better artist. Because the only way you're going to learn and become better is through practice and through making mistakes. Right? Mistakes are important. You know, so often um, in life we're taught that mistakes are bad and you're not supposed to make mistakes, but you are. Mistakes are the most important thing you can be doing, you know. You have to try new things and you have to fail at them. If you don't fail at them, you don't learn. So while you're working on a painting, if you're not failing, you probably aren't pushing hard enough, right? Failure is not a bad sign. It's, it's good. Like get up and keep going, right? It's like repaint that hand 10 times and get better reference. And, you know, don't try it. Just don't feel like you should be able to just paint it right out of your head without thinking or looking at something you get good reference and then you'll be able to do it. And then maybe you need to draw five different times, you know, maybe you need to draw a few different poses. Maybe there's something wrong with your perspective, but if you sit down and work through those things. That's where the important growth happens. So, so put in the mist cloak, right? And all that was, was I just took a square brush and put in a bunch of, um, lines and then I locked the transparency on it and painted in the bright areas right so I couldn't paint outside of it so I just took a brush painted in the bright areas and then um unlocked the transparency and added a little bit of motion blur just to the edges now I did this in procreate and procreate now has a new feature where like if you add a blur let's say you add motion blur it used to do it on top of the entire layer, but now you have the option to use either that blur on the whole layer or I think the option says pencil. So you can draw in the specific area where it's going to blur, which is like black and white. And that's super helpful for this sort of stuff. At this point, I'm finishing up the dagger feeling pretty good about my character. Decided she needs some sort of pipe to be holding on to back here. Cause she's not anything, she's not holding on to anything. Um, I still have her on a separate layer. I have the building she's connected to on a separate layer. The background has been flattened down, I think at this point. And then the building to the right is also on a different layer. So I know my values at this point aren't perfect, but by keeping them on those different layers, I know that I'm going to be able to go back and adjust some stuff. I'm going to be able to brighten up the background a little bit around her, add some more fog and stuff. And then I'm going to be able to add some adjustments to her, kind of darken stuff. The other trick here is, yeah, I want mist kind of flowing around everything, and that makes it kind of difficult. 
But you see right now, I'm doing a, it's a clipping mask. So I've taken the layer on top of her, added a clipping mask with just like, I'm using black and I'm just erasing it in and out. Right now, just thinking about how I can add some more dynamic lighting to this. And I know if I add mist behind her, that will, because the mist is lighter than her, that'll help with the uh, silhouette. The mist on the bottom is there to help push your eye up back into the image. Yeah, so at this point, it's just kind of mostly just kind of pushing and pulling, um, getting things to read how I want. And then that red right there was a flash. That was just a, like a gradient map. And I'm using that to adjust my shadow color and make my shadows kind of a little red. And then the very end is just a little bit more of that sort of rim light pop. And I think that's it. Oh yeah, a couple little more glows and stuff. There we go. And that's it, guys. So yeah, thanks for joining me. And happy painting, I guess.